today's scripture reading. <clears throat> I, Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 10. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Psalms 24, 1 through 8. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the river. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, the word of the Lord. This season, the uh, series that we're, the theme that we're using for the season is, Where Could I Go But To The Lord? And our focus has been primarily on the idea that in the world in which we live, that is so filled with chaos and confusion and uncertainties and People are being overwhelmed by hatred and anger on the one hand and fear and apprehension on the other. It's, it seemed important to me that we go back to that old Southern Gospel song, Living Below in This Old Sinful World. You remember that? And we've sung it here many times. Where could I go? Where could I go? But to the Lord. Do you have any bank account that will give you that kind of security and sufficiency? Do you have any doctor that will provide the kind of health and healing that God can provide? Do you have any kind of peace that you can pour out on the earth and bring a cessation to all the wars that are going on? No. We don't really have any other options. It's either go to the Lord and trust Him <coughs> or try to live it on our own and live in misery and fear and uncertainty <laughs> and inevitable failure. And that's where we are. We're not the only generation to have that type of climate in which we live, but it is our generation, and we need to take a good look at that. So where do I go but to the Lord? And as a part of that, during the Christmas season, uh, we took a look at some of the names of Jesus, and uh, we examined the prophecy in Isaiah where he's described as Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We looked at the statement that John made that he is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. 
And then we examined some of the names that were, Jesus, that were given to Mary and Joseph about Jesus who was about to be born. His name would be Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. He also was called Emmanuel, God with us. And then last Sunday, we took a look at the, a belated part of the Christmas story, and that was the arrival of the Magi, and they called him King. And so today I'm going to continue and build on that, and we're going to start looking at the idea of just how big is your God. And I've mentioned this before, J.B. Phillips, who wrote the Phillips translation of the New Testament, wrote a book many years ago called Your God's Too Small. And for most of us, that would be true. How do we learn how big God is? Well, one of the ways that we can do that is by taking a look at some of the primary root words that are found in the Bible. And I don't want to get into any kind of a detailed and, and technical type of study this morning, but I did want to talk to this because you see, your view of God is going to determine to a large extent the way you respond to Him during the circumstances of your life. The way that we develop our understanding, one of the ways that we develop our understanding about God, because I can tell you this, the more you know about Him, the more you will know Him. And the more that you know Him, the more you will understand His ways and how He works in your life. And the more you understand that, the less stressful life will be for you. And so this morning, we want to take a look at the three major categories of God's name. There are thousands of names that are used in the Bible for God. And as we look at this, we're just going to take a, a quick look, I think. And I don't, like I said, I don't want to get too technical on this. But in the days of, in which the Bible was written, names were not given to people just to give him a point of identity. Oh, that's Bob, or that's George, or that's Sam. But the names that were given in the Bible and throughout much of our ancient culture here in this country and in North America, the Native Americans used many names like that. Where they And the names were used not to give them a sense of identification, but to describe who they were. And that's the way it is with God. You see, if you want to know more about God, then take time to study his names. Now that's not the only way that you can know more about him, but it's a good starting point. And to, so what we're looking at today is the fact that there are three general categories, I suppose you can say, of the names of God in the Bible. You have, the first group is the name El. E-L is the way you, we would spell it here. And this is a name that has to do with God's power, God's strength, his, his ability to do something. And this is the very first word, this is the name that is used for the very first verse of the Bible in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. And it's the word El or Elohim. And that's one of those three major categories then you have a second category that falls under the prefix of Adonai. The word Adonai, in essence, means Lord, Ruler, Master. And then later in Scripture, you have another set of words that are introduced, and that's the word, uh, that's the word Jehovah, or Yahweh. Every part of God's nature can be found and is housed within the, each of those categories. And so what I want to do this morning is just kind of go through that because the, 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 the Elohim or the El names all refer to the power of God. The Adonai always refers to the, uh, the mastery and the lordship, the sovereignty of God. And then the second word, Jehovah God, is a word that re relates specifically to his promises. So you have his power, El, you have his preeminence, Adonai, and you have his promise, Jehovah. 
And many of you have probably already studied the covenant names of God, and we're going to look at a lot of those in the next several weeks. But we have to get a good understanding of this because we have to see God as the creator of everything who is all-powerful. And if God can create the heavens and the earth as it describes there in Genesis 1.1, and then over and over it says, and God said, let there be this, and it was so. And God said, let there be this, and it was so. And there is no such, in the Hebrew language, the, the phrase, let there, is not, is, not there, is not a part of it. It basically says, and God said, firmament be, and it became. God spoke. The Bible tells us very clearly, it was through the word of his mouth that the world's were created and brought into existence. And so we have to understand that God is an all-powerful God. And you see some of the words that are used there. The word Elohim, for example, which means all-powerful. That, and that's the one that was used. El Elyon is the most high God. El Olam is the everlasting God. El Shaddai, which is one that we sing about, used to sing about at least, called the Almighty God. All of the El Names of God refer to the power and the strength of God and that He is absolutely supreme. The second thing that we see, and, and you can see in the study guide, and, and as I've said almost every week, that's for you to study when you get home, uh, but it, his, his name is a personal name to us. It's, it's, he's not some distant God like those gods that the, kings of, uh, that the priests of Ahab, the priests of Baal worship. He is a personal God. He is a personal God. He is also a, a, a uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he's a, a preeminent God. He, and and, and I've, as I said, I've listed these here, so I don't want to take a lot of time with it. But Elohim is the infinite, all-powerful God that shows by his works that he is the creator and sustainer of all of life. This is why Paul was able to say, in him I live and move and exist. When he stood on, on Mars Hill in Athens and spoke to the city leaders of there, the intellects, the highbrow people there, and he talked to them and he said, I see that you are very religious people because you've got a statue for every god. You even have one for the ungod, unknown God, and, and I, he's the one I'm going to tell you about. See, And so we find that he is the all-powerful God, but he's also a personal God. And you get this from the El Ohai, my God. He's described, for example, the God of Abraham. He's the God of my strength. He's the God who is near. He's that kind of God. You see, he's a God that you can know personally. You can know the one who is all-powerful and who has all strength and all might. But then you also have him as Adonai. The word Adonai deals with his authority because the word can be translated Lord, Master, King. And this, the interesting thing about this is that in the second chapter, I think it is, of Genesis, the writer of Genesis, which most of us agree is Moses, put the word El and Adonai in the same verse. And this is what it says. The Lord God, after, before man was created, this is the point I want to make, before man was created, after God had created the heavens and the earth, and he spells that out in Genesis chapter 1, then in chapter 2, before he creates man, he says, and the Lord God, he is the ruler of who is all-powerful. And that's your God. See, let me ask you a question. If you have power, but you don't have the authority, the ruler, the, the rule behind that power, what good does your power do? But God is both the creator, the all-powerful creator, but he is also the ruler of mankind, the ruler of the universe. And this is what we find in here. And he has all of these different uh, scriptures that, that I've listed some of them in, in the uh, study guide. And then the third section is the word Jehovah. That's the third category. Jehovah is God's personal name as our Redeemer. 
So here, all of a sudden, you have God, who is the power behind the universe. You have the God who is the ruler, who is preeminent in the world, in the universe. And then you have the God who is the promise keeper. Jehovah. Jehovah. I don't know if that means a lot to you or not, but he is our redeemer. That's our redeemer name. And uh, we have sung here on occasion, I think, maybe, a little song that I mentioned to you a lot of times. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, all are blessings of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. That's because he's Yahweh. He's Jehovah. He is the God who wants to enter into covenant with us. You see, the thing that makes us in right relationship with God is a blood covenant. And I don't want to take a lot of time to get into that. That's a whole study in itself. But let me just give you kind of a quick overview. We have certain ceremonies in our culture that actually illustrate the blood covenant. And one of those is a wedding ceremony. Now, in ancient days, including days of the Old Testament, whenever God was going to enter into a covenant relationship with man, they would offer a sacrifice. One of the earliest examples of that is we find actually in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, when God shed the blood of an animal, Genesis 3, I'm sorry, where God shed the blood of an animal and gave clothing of skin to Adam and Eve to cover their sin. But it was the skin, the animal skin, that covered their outer bodies, but it was the shedding of blood that covered their sin. Profound, profound thought. And then, then you could go on. You could see in when Noah came back after the flood, what did Noah do? He built an altar, and what did he do? He shed blood. He offered a sacrifice. When Abraham was coming into the promised land in Genesis chapter 12, what did he do? He shed blood. That's why the scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there is no way possible that we can have a personal relationship with Christ. I remember years ago, and some of you may, come, may be from that denominational background, when there was a whole movement probably 30 years ago to remove all of the hymns in their hymn books that had the word blood in it. Well, I'm telling you that when you remove blood, you have no religion. You have nothing. Because when the blood of Jesus Christ, which Scripture says cleanses us from all sin, when that's removed, you have no hope. So it may, not, it may be a messy situation, but it still is the fact of God's word that it's the blood of Christ. Now, so when people would come together, whether it was a king or uh, a, a, between two kings or whoever it might be, two, two neighbors or so on, they would oftentimes, they would always would, would celebrate or would honor that with a covenant, a blood, a blood sacrifice. And that blood sacrifice basically involved the two people coming together and bringing them with them a leader, a, pri a priest of some kind, somebody who was in authority, and then they would bring witnesses, family members or friends or so on like that. And they would kill that animal, lay it out on the ground or on the altar, but mostly on the ground, and they would take two halves. They'd have one half here, one half here, and they would lay that out, and one of the first things they would do is they would do a, a, a circular eight pathway where each of those two people, one over here and one over here, and they would come around and they would do a, a figure eight around those two animal sacrifices and they would meet in the middle. They were coming together. They also would exchange some kind of garment as a testimony that they were entering into this covenant relationship. And they would put those garments on. This person would give the other person a government, the, a garment, the other person would give the other, the other one a garment. They also would put a, give them a belt 
And oftentimes they would give him a little weapon and they would hang that weapon on that belt. And that would be part of the sacrifice. But when the blood was shed, the blood would be poured into a, a container of some kind, a cup. And added to that would sometimes be some wine. And that would be stirred together and each of those two people, they would drink from that goblet, from that cup of wine and blood mixture. And that was their testimony of saying, because life is in the blood, your life is my life, my life is your life. We are now one and the same. And then they would take the knife and they would cut their wrist or their arm or their hand, each of them, and they would clasp hands or clasp wrists so that the blood mingled. And in doing that, they were saying, my sacrifice, I will, I will sacrifice for you and you will sacrifice for me. Now, do you see the similarities of that in the wedding ceremony? It's the ring that is the, cut, is the belt. It's the giving and the, the, the taking of communion that is a part of it. It is the, the, the bride wearing white. And by the way, I might say this, that the reason the bride wears white was not because she was pure, but it was the groom's commitment to see that the wife was, a, uh, was going to be able to live a life of honor and purity. And so you had this blood covenant, and in that process, as they would stand before each other, they would make promises to each other. Now, the unique thing about it is that when you and I enter into a covenant, and by the way, a covenant is not a contract, because a covenant is where the, 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 the dominant person in that covenant relationship not only assumes responsibility for himself, but he also assumes responsibility for the other person if that person fails. And this is what Jesus did. This whole idea of the names of God and that Jehovah, the covenant keeper, is at the heart of who he is, is an amazing, amazing truth. So when you come to faith in Christ, you don't shed your own blood. He sheds his. And when Jesus died for us and saved us, he took not only full responsibility that he had to forgive us and give us eternal life, but he took our responsibility. That's why the Bible says that you and I have been robed in the righteousness of his son. The, the robe, the garments that the people exchanged with each other, that was a sign of righteousness and holiness. And so, like I said, I just don't have time to get into a lot of detail on this, but but when we see who God is, we have to understand that He is a God who is an all-powerful God. But He is also the Lord and Master and King of our lives. And He is also the God who will keep promises with us. And you look at some of the names, and we, we will look at some of these. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Rophe, the Lord who is our healer. Jehovah Nisi, He's our banner that, under which we march. Jehovah Shalom, He is our peace. Jehovah Raha, he is our shepherd, and so forth and so on and so on. And we're going to look at some of those in more detail. So what is it a name? What is it that uh, we have to deal with? How big is God? How big is your God? Well, when I was a student at uh, Grand Canyon many years ago, I was, a, as I've said before, I was a vocal music major, and there was a, a cowboy actor. He was basically a rowdy cowboy from Los Angeles, a guy named Stuart Hamlin. And uh, he's the, uh, the one who introduced John Wayne to Christ, by the way. But Stuart Hamlin was an alcoholic who made all kinds of trouble, got into all kinds of fights in Hollywood. He was, the, he was known as the Hollywood troublemaker. And somewhere, someone invited him to go to a Billy Graham crusade in 1948. First the crusade that Billy Graham ever did in California, and one of the first ones he ever did on a large citywide scale. And Stuart Hamlin came to faith in Christ. And he also happened to be a songwriter. And most of you will know the song, This Old House. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna, you, you remember that one? Anybody? 
Does anybody not know that one? I thought, okay. Well, another song that he wrote was one called How Big Is God? And while I was a student at Grand Canyon, I ran across this song and an album that was sung by Greg Lauren, who was also from California, the singer. And so when I was preparing for today's message, I remembered that song. I would love to have sung it, but there are two reasons. I can't carry a tune much anymore, and Joanne didn't have time to learn the music. But I did put it in the bulletin. I want you to listen to this. Though man may strive to go beyond the reef of space, to crawl beyond the distant glimmering stars, this world's room, small, so small within my master's house, the open sky, just a portion of his yard. How big is God? How big and wide is vast domain? To try to tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe and yet small enough to live within my heart. Isn't that amazing? As winter's chill may cause the tiny seed to fall, to lie asleep till awake by summer's rain, the heart grown cold will also warm and throb with life anew. The master's touch will bring the glow again. So how big is God? How big and wide is vast domain? To try to tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe and yet small enough to live within my heart. Your understanding of who God really is and what he really is like will determine the extent to which you trust him. It's that simple. First Chronicles 29, I want to read this to you. This is a wonderful story. God had promised David, or David had had a desire in his heart to build a permanent dwelling place for God, a temple. Because up to that time, they were still meeting and worshiping God and offering sacrifices in the tabernacle that was basically located in Shiloh. And uh, David's desire, that his passion, was to build a place in Jerusalem where people could come to worship and where sacrifices could be offered. And he spent that, all of his adult life and his life as a king, that passion was in his heart that when it came time to do it, God said, you can't do it, David. You can't do it. First of all, you're a man of war. My temple is to be a house of the prayer of peace for all nations. And not only are you a man of war, but also you're a man who has been unfaithful. And God said, but I will let you, or let your son Solomon build the temple. So when it became obvious to David that he was not going to be able to do this, you can read this in 27, 28, 29 chapters of First Chronicles. David gathered the people together and he said, God will not allow me to build the temple that I want to build, but I can gather the resources so that my son can build the temple later. And so he began to talk to the people and to share with them. And the scripture tells us, if you read in chapter 27 and 28, David basically bequeathed all of his possessions to the the uh, treasury that was set aside to be the way the temple building would be funded. The people were so overwhelmed by what David did and what David had to say about his dream, the dream of his life that he would never see happen, <laughs> that they just opened their purse strings and they just poured. And the, the scripture records all of the vast amount of money, the jewels, the the, 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 the precious stones, the gold and the silver, all of this. And so at the end of that, then David prays. And I just want to read this to you as we come to a close this morning. Verses 10 through 14 of First Chronicles 29. 
So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And he said, Blessed, O Lord Jehovah, God, Elohim, of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and your rule over all. And in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you, and from your hand we have given thanks. One of the songs that David wrote as a young man was what we know as Psalm 24. Who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? But there's a part of that that says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift up your doors so that the King of glory may come in. For many years I used to think that David was saying, get your head up and look. And then I did some more research and realized that in the day in which David wrote this song, the kingdoms around him had temples where their gods were supposed to dwell. And Egypt was a classic example of that. And if any of you have seen some of the Ray Vanderland videos, you know what I'm talking about. And I mentioned this, I know, last year. But when it says, lift up your head, it's not talking about the person, it's talking about the header across the top of the gate. And in Egypt, the pharaohs always built temples to their gods where the doors, the gates, were enormously high, taller, much taller than even the walls of the city. And you, some of you have seen those. And then on each side of that wall or that gate would be an image of the pharaoh. And he was always smaller, but he always had the two images, the two tools or instruments that represented, he represented the God who was going to go through that gate. So the bigger the Pharaoh wanted the God to be in the minds of the people, the taller he built the gate and lift up the head so that there's more and more room because God, this God is too big to get through this gate until we get that head up higher. You see. Those of us who have done a little bit of building, we use the term header because that's what you put across the top of a window or a door in order for it to have strength, in order for it to, to be able to bury the weight of the roof above. This is what David is talking about. And he's saying, your God, who is this king of glory? He's the Lord, strong and mighty. So this needs to be, in fact, and Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.17, he said, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the point is this. You and I should be in a constant search to know more about God so that we can know Him better. And so in knowing Him better, we enter into a deeper, more intimate relationship with Him. It is through the blood of Christ that you and I are able to enter into those covenant relationships that the Old Testament describes in such detail. But here's my question. Is the God that you serve and that you name as your God, is he all-powerful? Is he Elohim? Is he Lord and Master and King? Is he Adonai? And finally, do you know him and understand him as Jehovah, Yahweh, the promise-keeping God that makes covenant with you? He has already, if you've committed your life to Christ, God has already entered into a covenant relationship with you. And here's the amazing thing about it. Even when you and I fail in keeping our end of the bargain, Jesus Christ has taken upon himself 
to not only keep his end of the bargain, but keep ours as well. That's why eternal life is eternal. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, Scripture says, but it is by his great mercy that he saved us. So when you somebody asks you how big is your God, you can just tell them, he's really, really, really big. Aren't you glad? Amen. 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 Well, let's pray together.